and welcome to another episode of Going Pro, a podcast in which we discuss how to make a living as a professional photographer by examining the lives, careers, and creative habits of professionals at every level of experience, as well as the creative producers, art directors, and photo editors that hire them. I'm your host, Brad Vassallo. Back in the fall of 2020, I made the difficult decision to leave a very secure but soul-sucking job in city government to pursue photography as a career. This show is my excuse to ask the people that I respect and admire how they have navigated various stages of their own career. In this episode, I talk with Will Saunders. Will is a commercial photographer and has been widely published in Outside Magazine, Sidetracked Magazine, Surfer's Journal, and Ski Journal. The bio on his website reads, quote, A serious understanding of different sports and environments allows Will to go to remote places, rock walls, depths of the ocean, and to the tops of the Himalaya all while being comfortable and in his element, end quote. His diverse expertise across these different outdoor adventure sports has led him to work with brands such as the North Face, Under Armour, Dick's Sporting Goods, Red Bull, Specialized Bikes, Fjall Raven, Columbia Sportswear, Patagonia, Black Diamond, so on and so forth. Finally, Will was the overall winner of the 2021 Red Bull Illum Photo Contest, the self-described greatest international imagery contest dedicated to adventure and action sports photography. So without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Will Saunders. Will, welcome. Um, So I I first came across your work uh, by way of Outside Magazine, as I'm sure a lot of people may have. Um, So specifically, there was a a cover shot uh, with Ian Finch and and Jamie Barnes um, paddling in a a canoe, that overhead shot. And... um, and what's funny is I was flipping through outside again recently and uh, and I was really impressed by a few spreads that I had seen that were you know shot in, in the Alaskan backcountry. And um, so I peel back the page to look at the photo credits and lo and behold, there was a little bit more of your work. Um, really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what was it? Issue. Uh, it was, I think, four hikers um, through, it wasn't Denali, but it was another uh, oh, national yeah. park in Alaska. Yeah. That's out now? Sick. It was, yep. I believe okay. the last issue. I'll have to so, go. So, um, yeah, yeah. And if that wasn't, you know, enough already, you're you're coming off the um, the excitement of an overall win for the the Red Bull Balloon Contest in 2021. Um, so I'm I'm just curious, like, what level ha- of exposure, uh, or what has that level of exposure from you know publishers and from photo contests like that done for your commercial career? Um, over these past couple of years? Yeah, I don't know. Like, that's a tough question to know what gets me, I guess, the job and if exposure is doing anything or if not. I think people see, you know, say a cover of a magazine definitely legitimizes your work. Um, But I don't know if it's the best form of exposure. I think it's like shows that you can take a good image um but i i hugely believe in like being good friends with people that you want to work with and they should be your friend first and then eventually like it turns into going and working together right especially if all your friends are in a similar industry whether one's a producer or creative director or you know any part of the actually you know it could be craft services too and they'll always like recommend your family i call it like the production family right like you want to work with your people and so that's the biggest one for me if you know i don't know if the exposure of a magazine got me some work i bet you it turned some creative directors heads it allowed me to send out like a newsletter saying like hey i had this accomplishment um but as far as getting work like it's so hard to know what's actually doing and i've you know i try every form of possible exposure to get in front of the right people but um, you never really know what does that i think the red bull loom thing you know it's still early on that I just, you know, got it and clients were, I guess that was the end of the year. So most, you know, commercial industries were going through their whole bank account and then resetting for the new year. So hopefully I was on that list. I've, you know, been busier than ever. So wouldn't be surprised if some of that is coming from there. But again, no one like says specifically, I want to hire you because you're the Red Bull Loom winner. You know what I mean? I think it just is another honor and accolade to add to the work but again I think just being good person with the right people is also probably the best thing you could do and it's amazing to win a 
competition like that. I never thought it would ever be something I did, dude. You know, like I just submitted it for fun because I think it's a cool contest and I fully support what they're doing compared to other contests. So wanted to be a part of it, but to think I was going to win the overall, there's no chance, let alone the category. So um, yeah, we'll see where that goes. I'm going to go meet with Ulrich um, over in Austria and kind of see if I can venture towards getting some sponsors maybe and do less commercial work and have just funded projects. So that's awesome. And what would that look like? Is that um, in terms of like personal work and they would just essentially fund an expedition that you would go on? Yeah, whatever it would be that I pitch or want to go. And there's some photographers out there, many of them, you know, like the Nat Geo level, because they don't do as much commercial work, but they're making historic and impactful work. So companies that believe that this photographer is going to create imagery that will change the world well, no different than a sponsored athlete, like a sponsored climber would go and change the climbing world, right? So they want to fund them. People will do the same thing with photography. It's not that common, like at all, especially now with like the influencer realm and everything, but they're like, you know, money you can have so that you are supported. Say you have three sponsors, you don't have to worry about getting jobs as much anymore. You can go and focus on this job that has or this project that has impact and you could spend six months on it if you want, because you're not hustling the freelance game, you know, so it's rare. I don't expect to get it, but if, you know, if that's possible, it's definitely the dream for a photographer, right, is to work on something that they believe is important and spend a lot of time on that. And so, um, yeah, we'll see if anything comes out of it, but that would be amazing. You know, if like that's what Red Bull Loom got me, then it would be, you know, (laughs) <laughs> there's nothing else I'd want in life I bet I bet so do you have any ideas what you would pitch if that was offered to you oh man uh not really because it's so I guess out of how do I say it it's like out of reach right now you know I could never think of like building a whole year out of just personal work So I just don't even know what I would pitch. It would like, I would take the time, a part of that, right. If like is three months of digging and just like research and finding out, like calling people and seeing what are important stories, you know, and then do another three months of work, go back to the edit, work with someone, look at it and be like, okay, go back for another three months and go and do that. Like, I mean, that would be insane. You know what I mean? And um, you know, most of my personal work has been 20 to 30 days and super proud of what I make out of those. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I haven't fully thought about it. It would be such a big venture into a different space that I'd kind of have to remap myself in a sense, because I hustle really hard in the commercial world, which is awesome, but um, it, it would be cool to do it in a different way, maybe towards something that has impact. Sure. So I, I do want to come back to personal work a little bit, but um, just to circle back to Red Bull Loom and, and to publication in general, yeah. I mean, a lot of photographers submit photos for publication, right? And I'm sure 10 times that submitted for the Red Bull Loom contest. Yeah. Having, having been published so frequently yourself, um, or at least from the outside looking in, it appears that way. Um, what do you think sets your images apart? Or, you know, in the case of these last few uh, images that have been published and, and with Red Bull Loom, what do you think set them apart? Yeah, what set me apart, you know, we look at a lot of photos every day and it's insane and bums me out because we look at them on a one inch by one inch screen. I think it's sick that we get to look at every photo created in the world if we want to, but it sucks that we look at it down on a small resolution screen. So, you know, like I think what sets it apart is being able to see it either on a big desktop or being able to see it in print and realize like there's more, there's depth there it's in focus it's like you know you can get away with absolute shit on a one inch by one inch screen it can be out of focus it can be blurry you know it could be bad light and it still will look decent because like the resolution is so small that you're looking at so i think like taking the time to really examine an image and i hope like my images have that depth that people want to like actually zoom in or you know, print it out, take a look at it, spend the time to see it. Um, And I think, I don't know. I mean, 
I don't think I'm doing too much different than many people, you know, I really don't. I feel like so many good photographers out there now that, um, that, yeah, I go back and forth if I'm doing anything different, you know what I mean? But I think you can tell when my work, I'm excited about my work for sure. Um, and there's, and the light's good. Like I get, I turn on for sure. Like if things, if the person I'm working with is excited and excited to be photographed and the light's good and we're in this, doesn't matter where we're at actually, just like if that, you know, dance is happening, you can see my work just fuck skyrocket. And then if it's not, dude, you can just see my image is good. Basically that's the difference between me like shooting what everyone else shoots and then me being fired up to create something that I know is going to be different. And I think mm -hmm. that's where you'll see my best images, you know, stand out for sure. So what is it? Do you do anything to sort of, um, I don't know, optimize your time on set to create the best headspace for yourself to, to try and make that a best possible scenario? Yeah, I definitely take the time for myself, you know, on, on set for commercial jobs. Like it's not my job, right? It's not for me. So I like the ego needs to be in check all the time on commercial jobs, right? Like it's not the time to go and create something that an image that you've had in your head that you're all dreamed up about. I mean, sometimes you do get a client that asks for something crazy and it's really exciting, but most of the time, like you're just trying to make a product look good in its normal environment and don't over spice it, you know, it needs to be approachable and attainable by like the average person, you know what I mean? So um, I think I just retell myself, like it doesn't, sometimes I wish it was more, you know what I mean? Like I just got back from shooting back to campus for North Face, right? So it's just kids, college kids walking around a park or, you know, a town. It's not, it can't really be anything more. We know it's the North Face brand. We think of them as these like badass mountaineers, climbers, all that stuff. But a lot of what they sell is, you know, sweatshirts and hoodies to people in New York City or LA. And so in my head, I'm like, oh, it's the North Face. It should be crazy, you know, duh, duh. but I'm like, also, you know, we're just shooting hoodies walking around town. If you can do that and do that well, you know, that's as powerful as it needs to be for this commercial job. And so reminding myself that sometimes that it doesn't need to be this insane, you know, it's not always going to end up in your portfolio on a commercial job. You know, it's just like you want to work well with the client and make something that they're proud of and excited to put in their campaign. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Chase Jarvis back in the day said something along the lines of uh, he, he did high dollar commercial work to fund his personal projects, not, not the other way around. Right. hundred percent. That's, that's why like, and it's so important and it's so important for new photographers to remove the ego from that idea of like, it's not just, it's not your fucking work. You know what I mean? Just make it for them and no different than if someone orders a pizza and wants extra red sauce, the chef might be like, that's gross, but that's what the person wanted, right? Just make it for them. You know, it's like, so if you can remove the ego and do that, and then when it's your work, go and give it everything and give all your passion to it. Not that you're not giving everything to the commercial job as well, but you, you know what I mean? Yeah. There's a time and place there's for the an tasting menu and it's yeah. not, not on, on a commercial set always. Exactly. So as long as there's an understanding of that, it usually goes really well. How do you go about building those relationships with the producers, with the photo editors to add your name at the top of the list for some of these jobs that they're looking for? Yeah, I mean, it takes time. This it, like never comes quick, but just, I mean, just like any friendship, right? So start with a simple email, then get on a Zoom, then send them a, I mean, sometimes I send prints. I've heard lately they don't want prints because they've been, had too many sent to them over the years. Um, but you know what I mean? It's like building these connections, staying in touch. I think it's a game of numbers, right? Like a creative director might be so busy, they can't be fucked with. So like, you know, the email is just going to go by. Them. And I've been there. I've been so busy that someone wants to, you know, ask me a question and I just like miss it because I have like deadlines. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you send maybe three weeks later and they just wrapped a job, they're doing pre-pro on three other jobs, your name pops up. We need to shoot, you know, in the mountains. Oh, Will's there. Boom. Put him on. So it's really a game of numbers, but initially making that connection, 
and seeing, you know, if there is a connection, I try, I don't talk much about my work when I do like the zoom stuff, like it shows, I have my website, I have my Instagram, like, I don't like to talk about myself. So let's just chat and see if we like each other. And I'm on the same field, like, yeah, they're going to give me a job, but I also want to know that I like these people and I want to work with them on set for five days or seven days. Cause it, you know, there's only so much money in the world that makes you tolerable to hanging out with bad people, in my opinion. So that's the other thing is just building those connections and fly out too. like if they're in L.A., like make a weekend out of it, meet with five or six different agencies over the weekend, you know, buy people beers, hang out. Um, so it's just constant marketing like that. So is it is it primarily just um, for a new contact, for example, that cold emailing or cold calling and trying to to build it up that way um you mentioned print being a little overdone at the moment i unfortunately for me if that is the case i have a print catalog that um i send out every every quarter to uh different directors and um creative directors and producers on my list mm -hmm. um and the email as well to try and hit them from different angles but what what is your primary marketing vehicle would you say uh to try and get in front of them yeah, I think you need to follow everyone you're curious about on Instagram, you know, and be legitimate and like be sparing and wise. But when they put something out that you like, tell them this is amazing. I'm really like impressed by this. First off, that's just like a small connection. Someone would be nice, right? It's like these tiny little building blocks, you know, and then maybe keep an eye on. Maybe they work with someone you like, right? Or that you've worked with before and be like, oh, yeah, say hi to Jill, like Jill for me. And they're like, oh, hell yeah, you know. You know what I mean? And then you start building that spider web keeps going and going. And then you ask, you know, for an email and say, Hey, I have, I'd love to talk. This is what I'd like to do or, you know, work into. Um, and then obviously send the thank you afterwards. If you really dig it, like go out and see them. It's like, yeah, it really is just small little building steps. I use everything from workbook, which is like the old agency style website. That's like a directory for commercial photographers. It's expensive and I don't know, you know, I'm, yeah, it's, it's a thing. It's cool, but I don't know. I still struggle with it sometimes. It's sweet because they'll set you up with meetings with creative directors once a year, twice a year. Um, so that's kind of a nice way to do it. There's something called Wonderful Machine. It's like another little directory. So there's a bunch of different stuff, but being pretty proactive in a game of numbers, right? If you didn't hear something the first time, it doesn't mean they didn't get it. Just like they were busy. So try again in three weeks, another three weeks, another three weeks. Um, yeah, Wonderful Machines actually based right outside Philadelphia where I'm, I'm based out of. Oh, really? So, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So I've taken advantage of their services before. Yeah, good. Yeah. Have you ever found any value in, you know, trying to build these face to face connections um, or face-to-face or -face relationships, doing trade shows like outdoor retailer or, or something like that and getting in front of people that way? yeah outdoor retail is funny like you know when I first started out in photography I was like yeah outdoor retail is going to be the spot I'm going to meet all these people and like honestly those guys are so busy during outdoor retailer like they're in meetings all day not to meet with photographers they're meeting for like their corporate side of things and so to squeeze into like 30 minutes of their day to try and pitch them some photography thing again it's like it's a game of numbers but that's not the time to do it but I will say like outdoor retailer is your chance to go party with like CEOs and put and CDs and for real, like sick parties are being thrown. It's probably the best parties of the year at OR, right? I went and saw Twista, you know, one time or whatever. Um, so that's a chance to be like, Hey, which venue are you going tonight? Like, let me get you a drink or, and that's a great way to establish the connection. Right. And don't pitch at OR in my opinion, you can leave like maybe a mailer behind and say, Hey, it was nice to meet you, but it's not the time. If they, if you connect with them, you know, maybe at lunch or dinner or, you know, a party afterwards, then go fly out and see them. But from what I've learned after pitching for four years or something at OR, is I realized like, Oh, just going out and partying with these people is way better than, you know, pitching them. They, that's all they're doing all day is dealing with pitches in corporate. So, yeah. It's hard to be making best friends with someone over a beer. Yeah, in terms exactly. Of building a relationship. Yeah, yeah. Hundred percent. So that's like, yeah. And now that's all I do. It's great going to OR now because I've like, I go there. I don't feel like I need to go see everyone at the trade booths all day. I can just like go meet, say hi to a couple people, 
and then cruise um, to whatever events are going on that night. Yep. So I, here's an observation that I've made. Um, so photographers are, are always preaching the idea of sort of finding your niche and not trying to be everything to everyone. And yet you're finding success shooting not only, you know, grungy trail running campaigns in Norway, um, but then portraits on seamless backdrops and, and commercial film too, and, and doing it well across the board. What, what would be your response to people that say that, you know, the way to find your way into the market is to niche down and become a specialist in one specific thing? Yeah. Um, I first off fully believe in it. You got to start out like I did. I started out just in outdoors, right? Like you never would have seen a white portrait on my website back when I was starting. You would have never seen any film on my like no video stuff. Like I was, I wanted to be the outdoor adventure guy. I was like, this is what I'm going to do. And I did like I spent did the 10,000 hours in the outdoor adventures. And I still have it. But I felt like, okay, I'm established now people respect me not as just an outdoor adventure photographer, but I'm a photographer now. Like they put in the work to know how to almost do, you know, most things in the photo space or at least have an understanding of what it takes. And so from there, that's when I felt like I can like, okay, let me dive into video a little bit. Do I want to, do I want to get video jobs more? You know, if so, let's put that into my work. Um, the portrait seamlesses, that was those are all just for me. I've only had like two jobs in a studio. All of those are just like passion projects that I was doing during COVID because I was so locked up. I had to do some creative work. And so I met an amazing stylist, amazing talent out here in Salt Lake City and worked on, you know, a bunch of fun little simple projects. But again, those, those aren't really for me to get work. It starts to like show clients like, okay, he can do outdoor space, but if we need you know, some sort of simple portraiture, we can get it as well. But I fully believe you got to pick one thing and own it for five, 10 years. And then doesn't mean you can't shoot it on your own or whatever, but don't showcase it in your website until you're like established for what it is the main thing you want to do. Um, and then from there, like you'll get the respect and you can go into any venue you want. But again, it'll take time. Like if I wanted to switch over to car photography, like I have zero car photography, you know what I mean? So I would need to take probably three to six months of building that portfolio for myself, but I know I could do it. I know I could figure it out. I know like what, in, what it all entails, but I don't have that proof of concept right now. I'd have to go figure it out for a little bit, um, but it wouldn't have to take six years anymore. You know what I mean? I feel like in six months I could revamp my whole portfolio and all of a sudden be a car photographer or be a makeup photographer, whatever that is. Uh -huh. Um, because the understanding's there. So stick with the one, grind it out, push it and make it as unique to you as possible. And then, you know, if you want to do some other stuff, start pushing that. Yeah. So if, if you're open to it, um, talk to me about pricing. So like thinking back to, to some of the earlier days um, that you had behind the lens, uh, how did you navigate pitch decks and quotes for clients that sort of held their budgets close to closer to the chest yeah um and weren't as open about what it is you know they don't know you they uh at that point they don't know you and they don't know what you have to offer so how do you go about getting that information from them or being able to put out a quote that's not coming out of left field for what they're looking for yeah i think you know, the big one is having an understanding of where you are at and what type of client you're dealing with and what is that campaign, right? There's different levels of campaigns. There's like the volume campaign that's going to go across everything at the company for three months and all to their vendors. And then there's like the quick social media campaign that's going to show up for a week and then is going to be gone and vanish, right? Like those two things alone have huge budget differences, right? And who they're going to choose might be two different people because they know like one or the other maybe not sometimes I get hired for the small ones too but I have an understanding of that this is going to be lower on the scale than the thing that's going around the world versus you know the social media one and then having an understanding of your clients right like North Face is way bigger than let's say like who's a small client I've worked for like 
I don't know, I think Gregory Backpacks is pretty small and they're local here in Salt Lake City. Like, I think I go into their office and there's like 10 people in there, 12. Um, so that's a big difference, right? I know that North Bay is gonna have more money than Gregory Backpacks, right? And so you just have to know like, okay, if this is what this person gives me, let me break it down to what their level is, what, you know, you can kind of see what's a bigger company and what's not, right? And then above North Face is, you know, a tire company, a pharmaceutical company, an energy company, and it just goes up and up and up from there. Um, so having an understanding and knowing that like, yeah, the different sides of the campaigns, I started out, you know, and I did things for super cheap, but it's because I was starting out, I knew the stuff that I was doing wasn't going to go like on a billboard in New York City. I just was hoping they were going to use it, but I still ch always charged. I think that's the big, the tough one for up and coming photographers is they're afraid to charge. And I was like, even if it's 50 bucks, you know what I mean? Like make, establish a business relationship. If you don't from the beginning, they're just going to use you until you're washed out. You know what I mean? So like, if you say like, this is what, you know, I charge, this is what I want. If they say they can't do it, be like, okay, I can bring it down to this for, and if they need a compromise, you do too. Like if they're like, no, nah, we need to come down 200 bucks, be like, okay, I can only shoot 10 images versus the 15 or whatever. Um, so just establish that business relationship and all of a sudden they'll be like, oh, he knows what he's doing. That's good. In the future, we're going to hire him on the bigger stuff. But yeah, I mean, pricing is crazy in the photo industry. I mean, absolutely bananas. It's all over the place. There's day rates that should be standard for everyone. Once you get to a certain, you know, like those level of campaigns, usage fees are kind of starting to die a little bit. Unfortunately, like those used to be a big thing and I still have some, but you know, I knew a photographer back in the day who said he would make a hundred grand a year just off of his licensing fees. You know, so that's a client who shot something the year before and wanted to relicense for the next year. And too often now, actually every time I get a contract from a client, it says in perpetuity and I have to go in, cross it out and say, no, you get two years or you get three years. And I know for a fact that there are tons of photographers signing that contract that says perpetuity because they don't know and so all of a sudden what that does is if say they shot like the best photo that you know let's say toyota's ever shot in their whole life they can now use that web banner or that for a hundred years so that's a hundred years of photographs that a photographer could have gotten hired for right but instead you know it's the banger they got it forever yeah. um and, and the relicensing is insane. You know, like I have a client that every year relicenses, you know, for 15 K. And so that's amazing, right? Every year there's like this bonus for something that I shot like five years ago. And it's because they do a one-year license and a one-year license. And if you think about it, like if the images are still strong and relevant, why would they spend, you know, hundreds of K to go out and do another big project if they can, you know, just throw 15 and have them secured. So that's something that's hard to establish, you know, look at your contracts, don't do perpetuity, no matter what, like if you have to bring it down to five years, even that's fine. But like, I truly don't believe anyone should own your work forever. I wonder why the client client doing 15 grand every year is not just doing a multi-year license at that point. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I've offered <laughs> a two year package and they're like, no, we'll just do the one year, you know, it's, just whatever their budget is for that year. Right. And they just need mm -hmm. to flush through it. So, um, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't matter to me. It's cool with me. <laughs> yeah. It um, keeps coming back. So, yeah. So what you mentioned, like Gregory backpacks being local to Salt Lake city. Um, and there are a ton of other outdoor brands in mm -hmm. the general area. What role do you think location has played in sort of growing your, your career? Because I mean, in my case, there have definitely been jobs that I've lost based on you know, the, the small difference that travel expenses make to get myself and crew out to a shoot in Colorado, let's say, mm. um, where instead a, a local photographer is, is gonna win that bid. So what has that, that meant for you in terms of being close geographically to some of those brands? I don't know if it's, I think it helped early on, you know, because I could meet it and go into the marketing teams and meet them for, but for the campaigns, like, if a company is penny pinching you because you're can't, you know, fly over there or I get it. If you're trying to go, everyone K 
can sleep at their own bed at night, you know, and then you don't have to charge hotel fees and everything. But for a quick flight, you know, under 400 bucks or something like that's crazy that they wouldn't fly out the person they want. Um, I don't get much work in Utah. Almost all my work is some of the brands are from Utah, but I'll fly to a certain place. I always try and do local crew. You know, I have lots of friends all over the place. So if I can, you know, hire a local crew, that'll help them. Um, but yeah, I think being in Utah helped me a lot, just being in the mountains, you know, and being around all these athletes and these companies and pushing myself to that limit. I'm actually moving to San Diego May 1st. So we'll see oh, if nice. that changes things. You know what I mean? I have no idea what that's going to do. That is not for work. It's personal, you know, health and just want to go surf and be in the water a lot more. So I think we'll see how that changes things. But I do believe once you're established, it doesn't matter where you live. I think you're going to get hired because they want you and a $400 flight is not going to stop their, you know, massive campaign from happening. Yeah. San Diego is a beautiful place to end up. I've, I have a friend there and I've been there before, so I'm Sick. sure you're going to love that. Yeah. yeah, man. I'm so excited just to change up and um, yeah, I don't know. It's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. A lot less snow there. Yeah. A lot less <laughs> zero. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, so when it comes to sort of keeping relationships with with and sort of maintaining a, a database of you know different contacts you have whether it's crew or um or the different contacts that you're looking to to market to whether it's producers or uh creative directors do you use any kind of platform other than workbook i know you mentioned um does that also operate as a, a crm for you or do you have a different system for that uh linkedin is usually a good one to just go find people um it's probably the best. I mean, I have my agent and she's always like searching for creative directors at certain places, but she usually uses LinkedIn as well, you know? So mm -hmm. that seems to be the place to have the most transparency of who works where, you know, mm -hmm. that's true. And then if you can't message them on there because they're private, you can at least follow them on Instagram and start that spider web again. Sure. Um, so speaking of representation, like what, what did that, uh, how did that relationship originate and how does that help you in getting new work what you've been able to do for you yeah I got really lucky um, a photo editor was working on my work for my website and an agent reached out to him and was like hey I'm looking you know to add one more person to my roster who do you think and you know he was looking at my work and he was like well check this kid's you know workout and she Quitsy, uh fell in love with it and um, at the time I wasn't looking for an agent at all I was still like I was kind of booming in my own like personal freelance so I was like I oh, you know I never even thought about an agent, but talked to some people, talked to her. She seemed, you know, amazing. And she is amazing, you know, like the cheerleader and so helpful. Um, and I think it does legitimize you for really big campaigns. She's amazing in the fact that I have my clients that I've built before she was around. You know what I mean? So certain, you know, my grandfather did clients, I guess. And she lets me have those jobs. And then we're really trying to work together to get the bigger campaigns for, you know, some of those fortune 500 companies or, you know, the ones that are just out of reach. You know, I feel like I have a lock on the outdoor industry. And so I don't need her help to pick out those for me. I feel like pretty solid in that. So she's kind of going for these other jobs, these bigger agency jobs and other stuff. Um, and it's been fun. You know, we work together, we've been on, a, we've done a lot of work that didn't pay off, right? Like those jobs are not easy to get. There's something called a triple bid which I'm sure you know of, you know, where the agency has to bid out the job to three separate directors. And so you put in all this time of building a bid and a budget and, you know, a treatment and calling all your people and seeing if everyone's available. And then that'll drag on sometimes for a couple months. And then they're like, sorry, you didn't get the job. And you're like, wow. Okay. Um, yeah. And that that's on repeat, you know, like that happens to us probably 10 times for every one that we win. And that's fine. Like, you know, that's a part of the game and that's the hustle. And I think people need to know that. Like people think I win all the jobs. It's like, no, you're always just hoping you win one. Um, but yeah, so that's how it works with her. It's been fun. It's nice having someone to support you and have your back. That's for sure. So for the jobs that you do win, uh, sort of the ones where you have a little bit more creative license and you're not just pushing buttons on set, yeah. Um, and, and are given a shot list. What does the, the process look like for you to develop a shot list and go from pre-production all the way 
through to post and final delivery of those images. Yeah, I think the treatment's important, treatment on both sides. So client usually sends initial treatment saying, this is the idea of our campaign. We wanna to go to a location like you know X, Y, or Z. We wanna focus as this is our theme, da, 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 da. And then from there, you kind of start having these discussions on how to fine tune it all, you know, what location is going to fit really well based off of, you know, the color and the look, and then what sort of talent should be in there. Um, you know, the color toning of the imagery and the types of shots that you want to do again, like it ranges, you know, for the stuff that's simple, like back to campus, there's only so much you can do, you know, they really just want it simple walking around. And then I've had clients like Gregory Pax who are like, go wild we want to shoot less walking and shoot more like people being silly and having fun outside you know so i have people like flying a kite on the edge of you know a cliff in norway or i have them playing the flute at camp or you know like doing things that maybe one in a hundred people do but the quirky ones will be like oh yeah i'd do that like that's sick they you know they saw me and it's it's basically you know like reflecting off of me right like i like to be goofy as shit when i'm outside with my friends and um so that it's cool having a client that allows me to do that and kind of do things that, you know, don't normally make the cut because um, they might be a little too far out there. But yeah, I think I spend a lot of time just like writing down ideas, things we need to do, pulling, you know, I pull imagery, not from the outdoor industry, if it's an outdoor shoot, I'll go pull it from fashion or I'll go pull it from editorial or so it gives me like, I already know what the outdoor industry wants and needs, but what can I grab from other genres to pull into it to make it stand out a little bit? And that's a big one with standing out. I think try to get inspiration from other things. Go to a museum, go to fucking like read a book, you know, and like get get some inspiration, not from Instagram. And yeah. I, I, it's amazing what like you'll see and be like, whoa, I didn't even know shit like this existed. And you're like, it's because we all see a person standing next to a waterfall five times a day you know, and so there's other things you can do. Um, so, well, is there, um, you know, I know we're coming up on time here. So is there any other advice that you would offer to a, a photographer who's just starting off or, or not even yet on their journey, but aspiring to become a, a professional photographer? Yeah, I think, you know, for anyone who's trying to do it, like you'll know, this is the thing for sure. Nothing. It'll keep you running nonstop you know, mind racing, it's exciting. It's unlike anything I've ever personally felt. And I know people can feel it in every sort of, you know, when it's something that you're passionate about, doesn't matter if it's like baking bread or photography, like when it clicks, it clicks. And I, there's, it's so special to see people find that and take it all the way, you know, um, but also give yourself space to be healthy and happy. But um, yeah, once it clicks, like go get it, drive as hard as you can and um, see where it takes you. Awesome. So how can people find you or your work online or, or otherwise? Yeah, you can find me on Instagram, Will Saunders Photo. You can check my website, willsaundersphoto.com um, or, you know, shoot me a message and happy to chat and answer questions with anyone. Awesome, man. Well, I appreciate your time. Yeah, and, thanks, Brad. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll leave you to it. Maybe next time I'm, I'm out that way, we can connect and grab a beer. Go to one yep. of those OR parties. Dude, of course. Please stay in touch. <laughs> of course. All right, man. All right. Cool. We'll take Have care. Have a good one. Thank you so much. Right. Yep. See ya. Hey, guys. Brad again. Just one more thing before you go. If you want to hear more about my own work and journey as a creative, head to bradvasala.com slash rundown. That's R-U-N-D-O-W-N. Become a subscriber and receive a short email from me every month with stories from behind the lens, recent travels, and digital access to a quarterly catalog of my latest work. It's a light read, easy to sign up, and over 100 like-minded creatives have already joined. So don't miss out. Go to bradvisala.com rundown to sign up today.